Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us, joining us this afternoon. I know everyone has very busy schedules, and I appreciate you taking time to join us for this very critical and salient conversation about what's happening at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, we see the news regularly about immigration, um, the undocumented, we see what's happening with the wall. It's a very political issue, um, but there are lived realities that this is affecting. It's not just a news item. And so we want to really get into what is happening and how this is affecting people in their day-to-day -day lives. And I'm excited to have Camilo Perez Bustillo from the Hope Border Institute join us to talk about human rights and militarization at the U.S.-Mexico border and their origins in the crisis of human rights in Mexico and Central America. It's a very complex topic. We're going to try and unpack it in about 45 minutes of presentation, but we want to also leave plenty of time to hear from you to be able to answer your questions and for you to use this time as well. Camilo Perez Bustillo is the Director of Advocacy, Research, and Leadership Development at the Hope Border Institute, which is based in Texas, in El Paso, Texas. He is also a fellow of the University of Drayton School of Law at the Comparative Research Program on Poverty at the University of Bergen in Norway. Camilo is also migration, involved with the Migration and Poverty Program at Flasco in Guatemala City. He is the founding coordinator of the Secretariat of the International Tribunal of Conscience of People in Movement, based in Mexico City, and he holds many affiliations with a variety of law schools and different universities globally, and in particular in Mexico City. Uh, Camilo has, will talk to you about their research and reports, and most recently he co-authored this book, Human Rights, Hegemony, and Utopia in Latin America, Poverty, Forced Migration, and Resistance in Mexico and Colombia. And we have some copies here that you can take a look at as well. So welcome. On behalf of the Honda Center for Human Rights and International Justice, I'd like to hand it over to Camilo to talk to us about these pretty heavy, important issues. Thank you. I really appreciate all of you coming out. And as Meredith mentioned, uh, we're only going to be able to sort of skim the surface, maybe, of issues that are complex and that definitely need deeper reflection and analysis, need a, a deeper dive. But I hope we can begin to do that through the questions and answers, and also by following up in the wake of this talk. I mean, I really see this talk as the beginning of a process of dialogue and of exchange. Um, I want to thank very specially Meredith for all the work she's done to, to make this possible, of course, her presence. Professor Beth Van Schack, who's really our host, I mean, for her hospitality, her support in making all this possible. And Gerald Gray, who's accompanying me, who is somebody who should have his own space to present <laughs> today. Um, who is the founder of what's called the Center for Justice and Accountability, with which Professor Van Schack was also associated as executive director, um, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary, and which for me is a very important inspiration in terms of the kind of work we do. Basically, one of the things I want to share with you, and I guess one of the questions, one of the dimensions that we want to explore, is what's the relationship between what we understand usually in terms of domestic policy, you know, within the, the physical and political boundaries of the U.S. as immigration policy and issues of human rights. Often they're put into different buckets and they're looked at as disconnected from each other. And I think one of our major tasks at Hope Border Institute that I represent today is to try to rebuild that bridge between those domains, the domain of immigration policy and the domain of human rights. Of course, for many of you, this is maybe familiar based on the kind of research and study that you're doing, but it's for us, it's really at the key, at the, at the center of gravity. Um, what I'm sharing with you also, as Meredith so kindly mentioned, is our most recent report that was presented in January of this year, which essentially asked the following question. It's this report entitled, Sealing the Border. Here we go. So you can go to our website, hopeborder.org, and I'll be passing around my cards and at least an executive summary of the report. We have a couple of copies left, the print copies, but the full report is available online, of course. So it's hopeborder.org, then you can go to the link for sealing the border. The subtitle is the criminalization of asylum seekers in the Trump era, and essentially the question we were asking was the following. Where do we stand in terms of immigrant rights and immigrant justice <laughs> one year after the inception of the Trump administration. So again, we presented the report on January 20th, 2018, intentionally uh, you know, with that resonance of the year before. And the question was, okay, what's happened during that year? How does that look at the border? And what kinds of issues emerge? 
And ultimately, that question about the convergence or not between immigration policy and deeper issues of human rights, issues of human rights that, by definition, have no borders. So it's especially complex to look at human rights at borders, in the context of borders. In that sense, we're talking about a task that has to do with epistemology. It has to do with how knowledge is constructed as to human rights and where the border comes into play. Um, so the question we asked is, where do we stand? And we tried to also draw that in a bit more specifically in terms of context. Uh, one thing that we have as a frame of reference for us, because we're a faith-based organization, we're an organization that grew out of work uh, on the ground, grassroots work in the communities of three uh, cities at the border. We're physically based in El Paso, but we also work on the Mexican side of the border in Ciudad Juarez. We do a lot of work in Mexico and in Ciudad Juarez. And then elsewhere along the border, Las Cruces, New Mexico. So it's those three communities. It's the diocese, respectively, of those three cities that give sort of the basis to our work. So we also have, as a reference, related faith-based approaches to human rights. So in the, the year in which we're commemorating the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination, of course, most recently, April 4th, that's an important reference for us. As we speak, it's the 50th anniversary of that commemoration, of that um, assassination. It's the commemoration of that. But it's also Dr. King's proposal for a new, for a poor people's campaign, which is being echoed as we speak by the call for a new poor people's campaign that's being convened by Reverend Barber and Reverend Harris. <coughs> Some of you might be familiar with that. All of that is part of our frame of reference. Also in Latin America and in Latino communities in the US especially, a very important frame of reference is the reference of liberation theology and the relationship between liberation theology and human rights. Some of you may be familiar with, with that from work that you've done. Dr. King emphasized the need to approach these issues from the perspective of the interrelationship of the intertwined evils of racism, poverty, and militarism. And for us, there's a very distinct echo of those triple evils, as he defined them, racism, poverty, and militarism at the border. There's tremendous resonance in terms of that perspective. So how do we approach these issues? First, I'd like to invoke the writing that, uh, that many of you may be familiar with of the German scholar uh, philosopher Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin reflected in his theses on the philosophy of history in 1940 at a historical moment that sadly seems to have many convergences with our historical moment. Today, he said the following. The traditions of the oppressed teach us that the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. The state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. One of his most distinguished contemporaries that many of you are familiar with as, as an absolute <coughs> pillar, uh, icon in political theory, Hannah Arendt, argued that this perspective, Benjamin's perspective about this issue, had to be applied to the status of the rights of the world's refugees and displaced people in the wake of the Second World War. She wrote about this in a very notable essay called The Perplexities of Human Rights that's included in her book about the origins of totalitarianism. Some of you may be familiar with that framework. Where she reflected from her positionality as a woman of Jewish origin who had been deprived of her citizenship by the Nazi state and driven into exile, right? And asked about that question, posed that question from that perspective in a broader framework. A similar approach to Hannah Arendt's reflection and to that of Walter Benjamin was taken, has been taken by Giorgio Agamben. Many of you may be familiar with Agamben's work, which cuts across many disciplinary lines, but we can describe it basically as work of political philosophy, who focuses on the criminalization 
of contemporary migration processes and their human protagonists. So this is Agamben, the issue of the camp, uh, bare life. I mean, again, many of you may be familiar with some of these issues. So think of Benjamin, think of Hannah Arendt, think of Agamben, think of King, think of poverty, racism, uh, militarism. Those are some of the strands that we're seeking to build on. So where does the border fit in all of this? And not just our border, but borders in general, but also in a more concrete way, not just our border at El Paso, Juarez, Las Cruces, that region of the border of a much you know, bigger region, but the border as we speak at San Diego, Tijuana as well, right? And we can, we can come back to that. That's particularly notable today as a caravan of hundreds, perhaps thousands, of asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants from Central America and beyond approximate, get close to the door that they're going to be knocking at, at San Diego, Tijuana, seeking protection in the US. And what's our response to that? That would be the question. As we speak, that caravan is moving in three different components, by land, by bus, by train, towards the San Diego, Tijuana border. And caravans are mobilizing on this side of the border. I was in LA on Monday hearing about this. Um, to receive them, to welcome them. And of course, they've been the subject of these tweets, which many of you may have seen <coughs> from President Trump, targeting the caravan as dangerous, right? As part of, of course, the overall uh, demonization of these groups by, by the Trump administration. So all of that is part of our context. We can come back to the caravans and all that. So what, from our perspective, what's the story that the border tells? The border tells us a story about how the state of emergency in which we've historically lived as border communities is no longer the exception, but the rule. And about how unacceptable, unconscionable abuses, serious generalized violations of human rights law are no longer the exception, but the rule how they become normalized and routinized when we look at the overall impact of the process of intensifying immigration enforcement from a specific positionality. I mentioned Hannah Arendt's positionality. So how do we position ourselves? We seek to position ourselves as we look at these issues from below, from the margins, from the perspective of the victims of these policies, migrants, asylum seekers, and their families and communities. Our priority is to place these voices and their suffering and resistance at the center of our work. That's the core. That's sort of the ethos that drives us. President Trump's continuing storm of tweets and the policies that have, and practices that have accompanied them have only served to highlight the centrality of racism and xenophobia to US immigration policy historically and today. We heard all these echoes this morning. Many of you may be aware of the Supreme Court argument that took place this morning regarding the travel ban case, the third version of the travel ban, right? its latest uh, iteration, the Trump versus Hawaii case, right? The, the, the argument was just heard this morning, which point, puts on the agenda all of these issues in that concrete context. And again, we can come back to that. So the bottom line is all of this is epitomized by what we see at the US-Mexico border. Our report, Sealing the Border, documents what this rhetoric and the policies which it implies actually mean in practice on the ground, and how abusive, unjust, unacceptable measures of the border have been weaponized and extended throughout the country. We define this in the report in terms of what we refer to as an iron triangle, which has three components, deterrence, detention, and deportation. This is the iron triangle that we were able to document through 300 cases based on observations in immigration court by students and colleagues like you 
every day in El Paso, in the El Paso sector, interviews with uh, immigration attorneys, defenders, and advocates, and the compilation of testimonies through qualitative methodology. The report is the fruit of that process. The border has been referenced as ground zero, quote unquote, for US immigration policy by US Attorney General Jeff Sessions during two very hotly contested visits to the border, one just uh, 10 days ago, and has served in this sense as a testing ground or laboratory. When he says ground zero, how we look at it from the border, from within, from below, from the perspective of the victims, we think of the border and its deployment as a testing ground or laboratory, but also as a scapegoat and a pretext. This is something that's recurrent in DC. When you go to DC or when you connect as a frame of reference to the debates in DC on the Hill about so-called immigration reform, one of the assumptions is that if we're ever going to get, for example, an extension of DACA, and we can talk about DACA later in more detail, and there were some legal developments about DACA yesterday as well, uh, whether we're talking about uh, extending DACA or whether we're talking about in general about the still pending unmet need in terms of comprehensive immigration reform and the issue of legalization and so on, um, the assumption is always made in the DC circuit, so to speak, that there's a necessary trade-off between any advance that might be made as to extending or reviving DACA in some form or broader benefits and a further increase in border security. That's the assumption. The only issue is how much more border security, right? Now, it's interesting if you look at that discussion from DC, the way we look at it is, no gracias, thanks, We've already done there, done that, been there, done that. We already know what the price of increased border security has been. So you're saying that it's worth, worthy of a trade-off to do more. What we're saying is, in our report, too much damage has already been done. And we're drawing the line, in a say. We're drawing our border and saying, no more, <coughs> basta. This includes an understanding of the border as we seek to engage these issues as what we define as a prophetic space. Prophetic in at least two dimensions. One is as a region, and I've, I've sort of suggested this idea of the reach of the border as kind of a laboratory, as a testing ground, right? Um, it's a region whose approach to immigration issues, enforcement issues, has historically shaped and prefigured national approaches. Beginning with the border region's birth as the product of a US war of territorial conquest intended to facilitate the expansion of slavery, what's known as the quote, Mexican War, and of course, the dispossession of the region's indigenous peoples. Those are the constitutive moments of the border as a region. And continuing with the border's militarization, so you know, racism, poverty, militarism, militarization, mm -hmm. first during and in the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution 100 years ago, and then during 1993 and 94, this is, let's say, the recent history, the still unfolding history of militarization at the border, 1993 and 94, in the wake of NAFTA, so free trade, Free trade understood as a form of violence, understood as a form of dispossession, um, with its neo-colonial and neoliberal dimensions of hegemony through processes of what we call border militarization. So when we look at images of the wall, let's place it in that framework of militarization. The continental struggles for survival, dignity, and justice of indigenous peoples are central to this approach. This includes reaffirmation of the Zapatista Rebellion's foundational indictment, indictment of NAFTA and free trade more generally as, quote, a death sentence for the region's indigenous peoples as a key point of departure. And it also means the echoes of all of this in the recent commemoration of the fourth anniversary 
of the, mor of the murder of Honduran indigenous activist Berta Cáceres for her leadership of this kind of resistance within the context of the fight against what has been defined, what have been defined as genocidal mega development projects in the Mesoamerican region. Berta Cáceres is present with us in this work and the commemoration of the importance of her work. And of course, Honduras, right? Let's think about that for a second. Honduras, the military coup in 2009 that was carried out with US complicity and encouragement, right? And whose fruits in a currently illegitimate regime in Honduras constitute an important part of the causes in a structural sense of the current massive flows of forced migration from Honduras. For example, the caravans that are going to be knocking on the door at Tijuana, San Diego in the next few days are 60, 70 percent composed of people fleeing that context in Honduras. So Bertha, Bertha Cáceres could not be more relevant and the struggles that she represents. That's the first sense in which the border is prophetic. The second sense in which the border is prophetic has to do, and this is because we work in a faith-based framework, it's more literal, let's say, the prophetic character, because what we suggest is that the border is a space that both inspires and challenges our faith. For those of us who approach these issues from a faith-based perspective, because of the individual and collective responsibility to take action activated by all of its concentrated injustices. Our report should be understood as an initiative grounded in critical processes of reflection regarding all of this, which is essentially a history of injustice, and how it is connected with and provides the necessary context for current proposals regarding the intensification of border security. We already know what intensified immigration enforcement has meant here in our region, and what the dimensions of its ultimately incalculable human costs are in terms of serious, generalized violations of our internationally recognized rights and dignity and of the quality of our lives and livelihood. Enough is enough. The price of such supposed bargains or trade-offs is too high and is unacceptable. As critical, committed scholars from the world of border studies remind us in their invaluable work, the border is a region characterized by binational and increasingly globalized processes of structural and state-induced violence. Structural violence, state-induced violence, which have been constitutive of the border as a historical, geographic, social, and cultural space, again, of dispossession and resistance. These processes both reflect and reproduce deeply rooted, deeply rooted asymmetries as to power, wealth, and equality between the US and Mexico, between the US, Latin America, and the global south, which permeate issues of migration policy. That's what the border is about. The intensification of immigration enforcement during the past year and how it has been framed only serves to deepen these underlying inequities and itself amounts to a form of violence. This includes the deliberate separation and division of families as a generalized practice by US state agents, CPP and the Border Patrol, which, as Gerald Gray has reminded us, amounts in itself to an act of torture and of forced disappearance the separation and division of families as a matter of policy. The injustice of these policies and practices is further exacerbated by the decisive role that US development, free trade policies, the drug war, and military and security assistance have historically played in promoting and reproducing structural conditions of injustice, poverty, inequality and discrimination which drive massive processes 
of what has to be understood as forced migration from Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. Migrants and asylum seekers from these regions, under these circumstances, make powerful moral and ethical claims, in addition to whatever their legal claims might be, that the US and other relevant national and regional legal systems and mechanisms must address fairly and justly, especially at the border, and as we hear the echo of those knocks at the door at San Diego and Tijuana. Key examples, case studies, are what the book that I'd like to share with you um, focuses on, I mean, just as a point of reference. Um, some of you may have heard, if you haven't, let's, let's come back to it in the Q&A session. How many have heard of what's called the San Fernando Massacre, or the San Fernando Mass Graves? Does that ring a bell for anyone? Was that, was that the cartel in Mexico? It's yeah. the Setas, committed by the no, Setas? Right, yeah, they, like 70 something people. Like, in Tamaulipas, exactly. So, does that ring a bell for anybody else? Okay. Because, I, I mean, my, my question would be we don't know about it, how come we don't know? Right? I mean, what? The, the issue here is mass human rights crimes, mass atrocities, and the need to have them in our consciousness and in our conscience, I hope. Um, I'm referring to a massacre that took place on Mexican territory about 90. Uh, minutes, 90 miles from the U.S. border in Tamaulipas in August 2010, 72 migrants from six countries, from Brazil, from Ecuador, from Honduras, from Guatemala, from El Salvador, and from India. We refer to it as the first continental massacre, of course, with India it's already global, but at least continental massacre, and are seeking to have it characterized in those terms by the Inter-American Human Rights System. For those of you who are interested in that, we can come back to it. We try to, in the book, kind of suggest some bookends about this, which are the Acteal Massacre. How many have heard of Acteal? Acteal Massacre in Chiapas, 1997. Think of the, we can come back to it. The, the Acteal Massacre was of indigenous campesinos, Mayans, in Chiapas in the wake of the Zapatista Rebellion. That was in December 1997. That's one bookend. The other bookend is San Fernando, August 2010. And the question might be, what are the connections? And the book tries to explore that. Um, so what did we try to do in this book and in this report to try and connect these issues? How do issues like San Fernando, Actial, mass human rights crimes, uh, structural conditions promoted by US policy, that produce and reproduce processes of forced migration, how do all of these connect to violations of the border? Um, let's talk about our report a little bit. Um, the report reflects a combination of the deployment of qualitative and quantitative research. Like I mentioned before, it documents about 300 cases, includes direct observation in immigration court. Uh, one of the things we're seeking to do here is connect with um, all of you around the table and specific um, research centers and programs at Stanford with which we could do research, with whom we could do research, but also we're seeking to um, draw you to the border as interns, as students, as scholars to join us in this, in this work. Um, this work was undertaken in the tradition of what's called community-based participatory action research. Some of you may be familiar with that paradigm developed by Orlando Falsborda and his colleagues in Colombia. In Spanish, it's called IAP, Investigación Acción Participativa. IAP is, along with post-colonial and dependency theory, Paulo Freire's popular education and liberation theology, among the key contributions of social movements in the global south to the urgently needed critique and renewal of Western epistemology and thinking from a decolonial perspective. So I suggested some epistemological dimensions of what I was going to be talking about at the beginning. This is kind of that element. The policies and practices we document in this report and our previous work violate both US and international law and are unacceptable ethically and morally. Somehow it's become acceptable to debate trade-offs of this kind, as I've suggested, and yet 
at the same time to systematically fail to address all of the ways in which the combined effects of US policies, as I've mentioned, as to development, as to free trade, as to the drug war, as to police and military aid, contribute decisively to the structural conditions of injustice that generate massive processes of forced migration in contexts such as Mexico, Central America, and Haiti. One very concrete expression of this. Let's talk about the victims of San Fernando. Among them were 14 from Guatemala. All of them came from communities, indigenous communities and campesino communities in Guatemala that had been devastated by US intervention and support of the military repressive regime in Guatemala that produced genocide in the 1980s and 1990s. Right? So there's a continuity, not just in terms of US policy today, but US policy in the 1980s. Right? So when we talk about migration from Central America, we cannot talk about it in a way that is decontextualized historically in terms of the history of injustice and how it unfolds. <clears throat> To further intensify the militarization of the border and the criminalization of our families and communities, which it necess necessarily implies under circumstances of this kind would be both irresponsible and irrational. Given the interconnected national, regional, and global characteristics and implications of the border, and of the abusive policies and practices that we have documented, we're especially concerned, and here's where Mexico comes into the picture, we're especially concerned about the extent to which these policies in the US context have been externalized and exported to Mexican territory, generally, and specifically to Mexico's southern border with Guatemala. So we're not just, quote, talking about the US-Mexico border, at the north. We're talking about the border between Mexico, Guatemala, Central America, at the south. And what we have found increasingly as an empirical matter, I mean, going beyond the conceptual framework, is that the same kinds of abuses that we've been able to document at the US's border with Mexico are being reproduced with the active participation of US policy at Mexico's southern border as the transfer of what we refer to as the burden of enforcement is made from the US to Mexico. That's the essence of what we've been hearing in Trump's tweets on these issues. When he targeted the caravan, among the things he said is, oh yeah, and by the way, we're trying to renegotiate NAFTA, and if Mexico wants, this is essentially what the tweets said, if Mexico wants to be able to get a successful renegotiation of NAFTA, it's gonna have to toughen what it does on Mexican territory to stem the flows so that they never get to the US border. And so we step back and say for a moment, so you want Mexico to do more to persecute and systematically violate and repress migrants on its territory to serve us? For Mexico, hacer el trabajo sucio, as we say in Spanish, to do the dirty work? Uh, we have some questions about that, just as we have questions about that other trade-off about more border security in return for more DACA or more immigration reform. How does this happen? This happens, again, through U.S. policy, complicity between the U.S. We're talking about a transnational framework of complicity and convergent responsibility in terms of international law, international human rights, between the U.S. and Mexico in the convergent repression, persecution of migrants as a suspect class. That's essentially the framework. We're gonna be working with our colleagues in Mexico and elsewhere at other borders throughout the world that are increasingly the site of equivalent approaches in the name of uh, you know, binational collaboration around security and immigration what's called governance, migration governance, um, within the context of um, international and regional forums through the UN. Many of you may know that at the UN, there's an unfolding process uh, culminating in September in New York and in December in Morocco to come up with a global compact on migration and a global compact on refugees. And we're gonna be injecting border issues into that framework, right? In the international <coughs> framework. 
but also within the, U the OAS, and some of you may be interested, um, in Mexico City in November, November 2nd to 4th, is going to be the 8th World Social Forum on Migration, which is sort of a collateral process related to the World Social Forums, and we're going to be there as well, raising these issues. So what do we need in response? What we call for is a national dialogue in response to the need to fashion ethical approaches to immigration enforcement. <clears throat> we join hands, this is from the conclusion of our report, in a collective call to conscience rooted in moral reflection and action with all of those who share our transformative vision of a global community committed to human rights and dignity for all where borders are morally irrelevant. At the core of what we seek to elicit and inspire in terms of needed reflection and action is the need to redefine the relationship that's latent in what I've tried to share with you between issues of legality and issues of legitimacy in US immigration policy. This is at the heart of broader issues as to international human rights. And again, it's what the book is mostly about. Again, the book and the reports are convergent. Let's think about this for a moment and how this plays out historically. Again, being hosted by the, the Hand to Human Rights Center and thinking about the history of human rights as sort of our framework. Let's stop and just think for a moment. And this has very much to do with, again, the inspiration for me of the work of the Center for Justice and Accountability. Think about it this way. All of the acts and crimes that are currently recognized internationally through the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court as crimes against humanity, war crimes, and human rights crimes, for example, genocide, slavery, torture, forced disappearances, apartheid, colonialism, discrimination on the basis of race and gender. I mean, we can just add to the list, but think about those for a moment, all of those acts currently recognized as crimes were once, and many of them recently, and for long, for centuries, considered to be perfectly legitimate and perfectly legal. All of those, right? Conduct of this kind has come to be recognized as criminal because of the critical reflective impetus of the human conscience and consciousness and spirit, often grounded in faith, which have driven the social movements which literally make history. In Spanish, we would say, los derechos nacen en la conciencia, pero se hacen in la historia. The suffering and resistance of the people of the borderlands region is a crucial contemporary test and challenge of this kind in our country and continent and world today. Someday our ch children and grandchildren will look back as they review documents and testimonies such as those we present in the report and seek to share in the book, and ask how it was possible that such practices were considered normal and routine, and what their elders did to address them. The response is in our hearts and in our hands. Muchas gracias. and very engaged and involved with the issues at the border and regionally and beyond um, from a human rights perspective. And I appreciate you providing, so often we deal with the tweets and the court rulings and the breaking news, and I very much appreciate the larger context, mm -hmm. the moral, theoretical, historical, political, economic pieces that you bring into it. Um, I have a lot of questions about your recommendations, Please. given all of this. But before I do this, I would like to, I, I have a list of questions, but um, I would like to turn it over to the audience and solicit your questions and engagement before I take up the space. 
So um, we've got a bit of time, so please, I'd like to I can send around you. also some cards and some executive summaries of the report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will pass those around. Yeah. Sure. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah, my understanding is that under international humanitarian law, um, the first country that an asylum seeker steps foot in, that's mm -hmm. the country they're supposed to ask asylum. Right. So why are Central Americans who have to pass through Mexican territory not asking for political mm -hmm. asylum in Mexico? Because Mexico's asylum office has been shut down. I mean, the, the short-term answer has been shut down since last fall. They're simply, simply incapable at this moment of processing asylum claims. They've essentially declared themselves as dysfunctional, and they're barely recovering their capacity as we speak, even to process individual cases. That's a, let's say, a mechanistic response. I think a deeper response would be because Mexico itself, as I've described, I think, and I've tried to suggest, is co-responsible with the U.S., complicit with the U.S., in terms of repression of those same flows, and that includes Mexico's own systematic violations of international asylum law and refugee law. So Mexico is not only incapable, but uninterested, right? It is not a hospital, let's put it this way, at minimum, it's not a very hospitable environment to pursue asylum claims. Now also, many of these families, one thing we should think about, let's, let's again step back a little bit. Of course, there's the very complex and very focused, detailed issues of asylum and refuge and so on, and we need to think about those. But let's think about these flows. So one thing that uh, the DHS does is it often you know, trumpets its data. And what it did in December is issue uh, its most recent set of annual data. And what it said was essentially the following. The number of border crossers has gone way down, way down in the last year. Deterrence has worked. We talked about the Iron Triangle, deterrence, detention, deportation. Prevention through deterrence is the way the Obama administration referred to it, because the Obama administration was in many ways uh, the cause of much of this, I mean, at least at a certain moment. Um, and we had those influxes of, of course, unaccompanied minors and families in 2014 and 15. That's when prevention through deterrence became sort of the, the doctrine. Well, what's the problem? The problem is that these flows are directly related to how US immigration policy works, the way it separates families, the way it makes it impossible, in effect, to legally reunify families that have been divided by borders and by immigration policy. Right? This is, of course, the critique of chain migration and so on. Um, but what the data does not highlight is that even though the number of border crossings has gone down overall, quote, deterrence has worked, maybe up until the last couple of months. The Trump administration seems to be worried that there's an upsurge recently, and that's why the tweets about the caravan and so on. They're afraid that the caravan is kind of the, um, the emerging point of a new tide, let's say. Um, what the data doesn't highlight is that while the overall numbers of border crossings have gone down, the numbers of family units and the numbers of unaccompanied minors have increased, right? So you have to ask, what is it about the conditions that produce migration that drive entire families and unaccompanied minors to, to migrate? What's going on? So again, I, think, I, think, I don't think the question about um, seeking asylum in Mexico as a so-called safe third country can't be divorced from that broader context. If anything, people are fleeing Mexico because it's unsafe for Mexicanos and Mexicanas. It's certainly not safe. This is the issue of non refoulement It's certainly not safe for those seeking asylum from Central America. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, although you know, it seems like your report is more focused on you know, attacking practices or condemning practices here in the United States and, and kind of have left Mexico added. Mm, no, I'm actually, I mean, I think the report, yeah, the report is focused on the impact of U.S. policy, but I guess what we do try to suggest in the report, and then you'd have to kind of look at it maybe more closely, is that you really can't separate the ways in which Mexico and the U.S. converge in this shared pattern of systematic violation of the rights of these migrants and asylum seekers on both sides of the border. And given the engagement on both sides of the border, both in the U.S. and Mexico, I'm wondering, do you engage policymakers or law enforcement? And if you could talk a little bit about um, any collaboration that you have with policymakers and law enforcement and specific policy recommendations. 
I mean, you yeah. highlight a lot of um, what you see going on, and I'm curious mm -hmm. to know what you would, if you have, or if you have the platform, what you would recommend to policymakers on both sides of the border. Yeah, I think despite our, our frustrations and our um, concerns and our cautions that I shared with you about the the tenor and sort of the dimensions of the debate in D.C. When necessary, we go to D.C. and we advocate and, and say what I said here. No? And so we were at a congressional briefing a month ago with the bishop from El Paso. Uh, we're housed by the diocese in El Paso. Mark Seitz, who's been very notable among those in the bishop's conference in the U.S. Um, in being at the sort of front line of defense of, of migrants. So when, when the issue is how to influence um, the legislative debate, we're engaged. Whether it's in D.C. or it's in Austin in our case because it's Texas. Um, one of the problems is this is maybe another set of bookends we might want to think about since we're all in California now, is think about California as a case study on the one hand in terms of state policy towards these issues and think of Texas on the other. California, of course, is one of the, quote, best states in the country, of course, with its flaws and contradictions and complexities. One of the best in the country is so-called sanctuary state and so on, on the recognition and respect for immigrant rights, and Texas is one of the worst. Texas has one of the most backward state laws, which is called SB4, which is basically, you know, its version of SB, of uh, Prop 187, right, in California, or SB 1070 in Arizona, or similar laws, laws in Georgia or Alabama. It's among the worst anti-immigrant laws. So basically, the same way that the state of California discourages cooperation between local law enforcement and ICE, unless it's in very narrow terms, um, Texas encourages that cooperation. Right? It's the opposite, mirror, mirror images. So we have to look at each other, I think, the mirror of California and Texas. I have to think about things from the perspective of California. I would urge you to look at things from the perspective of Texas and think about where we are. In between. So yeah, we're engaged in policy both at the state and national level, but also locally. What we're thinking about, for example, with this report is translating this report into a set of local policy initiatives. So for example, yesterday we were at Santa Clara University meeting with the director of its, interna its International Human Rights Clinic, and what he was talking about is the advocacy they're doing at the local level in the city of Mountain View, right, not far from here, or in Santa Clara County, or in San Jose in terms of translating human rights standards into local policies through the National Human Rights Cities Movement, et cetera. And what we're seeking to do is to do that in El Paso as well. We want El Paso to be a human rights city. Many of these cities have enacted uh, the convention, the UN Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination or the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CERD and CEDA, <coughs> as local ordinances and have turned those into local policies. So we think that's a very important uh, dimension as well to our work. Um, I was wondering, I guess the first part is, is could you maybe contextualize, I, I understand the statistics on this kind of thing might sure. be hard to, to find, but the proportion of border crossers who might be seeking asylum mm -hmm. versus those who, who may be trying to disengage with the state, and then also of those who seek asylum, um, you know, how many of those cases are accepted versus rejected? Yeah. Um, and then also more broadly, are there maybe any um, best practices or lessons from, so obviously the European refugee crisis yes, of 2015, yes. um, you know, international approaches to mm. um, asylum cases yeah. that you could compare to this one, yeah. or even... Yeah. You know, we go into that a little bit in the book. If you're interested, you might be, you might be interested in the book, the, the book about human rights agenda in Utopia. We try to draw on, the book was written at sort of at the height of the European crisis that you mentioned, and so we tried to sort of look at border issues more broadly like through a comparative lens, mm -hmm. looking at what was going on in Europe at the one, on the one hand, looking at what was going on here at the other, and also what goes on at the periphery of Australia, mm -hmm. Australia and the Pacific region. So really it's kind of a tri-regional approach. I think the bottom line is that there's kind of a global paradigm that's present in all three of those contexts, which is basically about securitization. It's about the subordination of migration policy to the supposed imperatives of national security. That's what happened in the U.S. post 9-11. It's basically a post 9-11 paradigm. I think a lot of us forget the Department of Homeland Security is new, right? It used to be INS. It wasn't ICE. It wasn't DHS. It was Department of Justice, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need to get into the weeds. But the bottom line is we sort of assume that it's legitimate to approach migration policy issues from a national security framework when, in fact, it's new and it's different. It's happened at the worst moments in U.S. history, sadly, like Japanese detention. 
right? And now the travel ban. But it has not been typically the way to look at immigration. It's, it's only become normalized and routinized recently. Mm -hmm. So there's securitization. Then there's militarization of the borders, which necessarily is the complement of securitization. Because to the extent you define it as about national security, you want to reinforce the border, physically, militarily, otherwise. So the wall shouldn't surprise us, right? And of course, the wall isn't new. I mean, there's already 750 miles of wall existing, right? The question is how much new wall there's going to be and how big and beautiful it's going to be and all that. Um, you know about the prototypes and so on. So second element, militarization. Third element, necessarily with securitization and militarization, is criminalization. Once you frame things that way, then there's this false equivalency that, of course, we've heard so much about, you know, Mexicans are rapists, right, et cetera. This false equivalency between being a migrant and being dangerous, being migrant and being criminal, being migration and criminality, migration and dangerousness, et cetera, and all of the echoes of that. And so the caravan is full of rapists, right, who are coming to the U.S. And so I mean, that was literally what the, what the tweet was about. So. Uh, securitization, criminalization, militarization, and the other two elements I alluded to earlier, externalization and regionalization. Externalization is this phenomenon of transferring the burden of enforcement from U.S. territory in an extraterritorial way to Mexican territory, and ultimately to the countries of origin. All of this you see not just in the U.S.-Mexico context, but in the Mexico, Mexico, Guatemala context, and in the Euro-Mediterranean context and the Australia-Pacific context. It's a global pattern. Mm -hmm. The last piece, so we start with um, securitization, criminalization, militarization, externalization. What it essentially means is that the US border is no longer at the US border. The US border is suddenly at the Mexico-Guatemala border, right? The European border, this was on the front page of the New York Times, I think on Monday, if I'm not mistaken. The, the quote was from a Sudanese national security official, and you know, the government of Sudan, of course, has been indicted by the ICC for genocide, right? Sudanese national security establishment is carrying out migration control operations at the request of the EU on Sudanese territory. That's externalization. But it's regionalization, because it's not just happening there, it's happening throughout Africa. Just like it's not just happening at Mexico's southern border, it's happening throughout Latin America. So it's externalization becomes regionalization. What's the last piece, and this is very important for us from a faith-based perspective, it's commodification. It's essentially migrants are reduced to their economic value. Whether that's in terms of their trafficking and smuggling, or in terms of the exploitation of their labor. But they're not recognized as subjects of rights. They're simply objects of exploitation. You know? So that's commodification. So we would say the comparative framework is very important. And essentially what we try to suggest in the book, if you're interested, is that these issues are global in character and that the post 9-11 paradigm is not just a US phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon, in fact. And what it means is buying into this routinization and normalization of state crimes, and that's that's the bottom line. Are you seeing any countries budding this trend? Are there any like to kind of build on your question? Any best practices? I think any lights of hope that in, yeah, your, yeah. in your in your right, perspective. Right, right. Uh, I mean, again, it, of course, it varies from state to state. It varies from region to region. I would be cautious about generalizing that all of these phenomena take the same form everywhere. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't argue that. But what I would argue is that whether you're looking at what the EU is doing or what Australia is doing or what the US is doing, the parallels and the convergences outweigh the differences. And that's very troubling to us. Now, within those frameworks, of course, there's pushback, right? Especially from civil society, especially from uh, you know, human rights organizations. Uh, this is the kind of debate that you see at the UN within the framework of the Global Compact on Mig Migration process that I referred to. What's going to be culminating at the UN in September and in December. Um, this is what you see particularly at the regional level, at re in regions like Latin America. But of course, that's also very much subject to the ebbs and flows of politics in each state. So let's say, where does Chile stand today on migration policy, or Argentina, or Colombia, versus where do 
uh, Guatemala and Salvador stand. A lot of it depends on whether you're a state of origin, you're a state of transit, you're a state of destination, maybe you're all three. A lot of it depends on are you a state party to the UN Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers and Their Families, right? There's a UN committee that oversees that treaty and its mechanisms. Um, there's a UN rapporteur for these issues in terms of migrant rights, who's currently a Canadian scholar, Francois Crippo. Um, within the OAS, I mean, you might see different trends at the Organization of American States than you see, for example, in African regional organizations or in Asian regional organizations. There are a lot of variations. Of course, what's happened to the Rohingya, I mean, the imposition of statelessness, right, and forced migration through expulsion, this also enters into the, the framework as well. So, I mean, again, there's all kinds of different case studies, all kinds of different countervailing forces. I mean, again, I think uh, the trend is not encouraging. Certainly, there are hopeful examples. But I think primarily there are examples that come not from states, but from those who challenge and resist states and their power and their abuses. Just go, to go back to a comment, I think one of the last things you mentioned was like how many asylum seekers are actually receiving asylum. Yes, I need to come back to that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I actually volunteered as like a, a, someone who did intakes for asylum seekers. And one of the things that I noticed was that it is, the asylum intake process itself is very, seems to be, it doesn't, doesn't make so much sense. Because in, in terms of like people who, I would interview a lot of people from El Salvador who are fleeing because maybe their cousins, their uncles are all killed by the <clears throat> Uh, which, to bring it back to the framework, right, these are gangs that are born in the United States that are exported to El Salvador, and now 10% of their entire population is um, affiliated with gangs because of the activity of the U.S. But back to the context here, a lot of the people that I was interviewing um, actually won't be able to receive asylum because they're not being particularly um, like stigmatized for their affiliation. So like how asylum you know, typically works, you have to be um, persecuted by some outside group because of your affiliation, whether that be maybe sexual identity or maybe political identity. Um, and so a lot of people, just because they know that they're next, right, like everyone around mm -hmm. them is dead, um, they can't seek asylum in the U.S. and they ha kind of have to wait until they're actually threatened to death to be able to seek asylum. And mm -hmm. so that just to me doesn't make much sense. I don't know if you have comments or anything. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't get to the question, the specific question about asylum. I and mean, what you just said I think is very, very important, everything you just mentioned. Bottom line is we're talking about mixed flows. So let's think about the caravans. Right, the caravans that are coming to San Diego, Tijuana. 60-70% um, the estimate is are from Honduras. T to what extent are those cases cases that should be characterized as cases of asylum, cases of refuge, cases of economic migration, mixed cases in each instance? Um, these categories are much more mutable, much more porous than we might assume. I mean, traditionally, the differentiation has been, I'm coming looking at this as a human rights lawyer and as a human rights scholar, traditionally the, very, the differentiation has been between, quote, voluntary and, quote, involuntary forms of migration. So more concretely what that means is if your migration is economically motivated because you're seeking a better life, and there's an economic disparity, you know, north-south between your country of origin and where you're headed, that's one thing. Right? And it's questionable in the traditional framework whether or not there's really a right there to migrate because, of course, there's the issue of sovereignty and the very complex relationship between sovereignty and human rights, which we would need to talk about. That's if it's, quote, voluntary or economically motivated um, migration. And then the differentiation on the other side is between essentially what's associated with the concepts of refuge and asylum, which is you're fleeing persecution. Right? You're fleeing a, a war or a civil conflict or a genocide, all three in Guatemala, um, or the drug war, which is kind of hazy in terms of its standing under international law because it's not an internationally recognized conflict in the traditional sense, right? The law of international conflict. How does it apply to a context like Honduras or to Mexico's drug war or Colombia's drug war? But, uh, hey, it's a war. <laughs> there are deaths, there are bodies, there are wounds, there are, you know, there are victims, but it might not be legally characterized as a war, right? Um, and the problem is that the realities are mixed and more complex than those categories. The human beings 
involved and suffering and experiencing these processes are complex. And so the traditional categories are not <coughs> as useful as they might have once been. Interestingly enough, this is the kind of complexity that Hannah Arendt referred to 60 years ago. She was writing in the wake of the Second World War, different historical moment, different reality, but much of what she wrote then resonates now. Selah ben Habib, who's another great migration scholar in sort of the Arendtian tradition, has written a lot about these issues. Um, the bottom line is this rigid separation between what is voluntary and involuntary, what is economically motivated, and what is produced by structural causes is mixed, is complex. And the other thing is, that's why in migration studies, a new paradigm has emerged, which is the paradigm I alluded to of forced migration, which cuts across both of these polar opposites. Right? Forced migration, essentially what we argue, those of us who sort of adopt the forced migration perspective, is that what is apparently voluntary in the act of seeking a better life is in fact the product of structural conditions over which people have no control. So it's not really voluntary. Right? I mean, you may choose to leave, but the conditions that produced your choice are beyond your control. And so structurally speaking, it's a process of forced migration. That's where the impact of US policy comes in, through free trade. It's not NAFTA, it's CAFTA, or it's bilateral free trade agreements in Benin <coughs> or in Colombia. Um, it's the EU itself, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's like, we have to look at, the, I think, what I try to do with my students, I mean, I teach in law school, what I try to tell my students is, if you came here for simplicity, sorry. <laughs> Can't give it to you. Sorry, it ain't got nothing. There's, there's nothing left in terms of simplicity. All I can give you is complexity, right? And that international human rights law and international law and all of the study we do about that has to evolve to reflect those complexities. But don't come to me if you're looking for simple solutions. Disculpa, <laughs> I'm dad, I'm not good at. Um, you mentioned a few times uh, like U.S. security uh, and military like policy and assistance to in, in Central America and Mexico. Um, I don't know if you can talk about what role like, the U.S. has in kind of finding like a sustainable solution or more sustainable solution to the refugee crisis in terms of like improving the security situation in Central America itself and Mexico itself. Yeah, I mean, this would be like a whole other talk. We should do a course, right? <laughs> right? I mean, we can think about that. We'll talk um, about that. Yeah, yeah, right. I think what I would say is this, is that um, what the U.S. is promoting, and this is independent of party, you know, it's Trump, it's Obama, it's Clinton, I mean, you know, whoever you want to pick, Bush, it's been continuous since 1993-94, it's been bipartisan in a sad way, um, is the militarization of public security in Central America and Mexico as a solution. And let me tell you, if there's one thing that's clear, I mean, take a look at what human rights defenders say and scholars say in Mexico who studied this on the ground, in El Salvador, Honduras, going back to Colombia where this story started. In fact, my family is from Colombia, so I kind of started off in Colombia and then I ended up doing this work in Mexico. And essentially the drug war moved from Colombia to Mexico. Those of, us, those of you who follow the series Narcos, anybody watch Narcos? Yeah, Netflix, check it out. Uh, third season, I think, now. The first three seasons were about uh, Colombia, the next season's going to be about Mexico, right? So essentially the drug war moved from Colombia in the 1980s to Mexico in the 20s, in 2000s, right? Um, bottom line is there's some real threads of continuity, right? And those essentially involve this insistence through U.S. policy on the militarization of public security. Okay, with exceptions and some administrations at some moments better than others and, you know, to me, Obama and Trump are not the same, but sadly, there were many convergences in many of these areas. Yeah. Um, and the bottom line, I guess, is that um, what that has produced on the ground is a generalized human rights crisis. So I mean, if we go back to sort of the title of the talk, and I think I sort of maybe danced around it, but let's bring it back. Um, the idea would be that we cannot understand the current flows the caravans knocking at our door, 
we cannot understand in a decontextualized way, and that it's especially perverse, maybe I should have said this even more starkly, I would argue that it's especially perverse in the context of asylum claims. For the US on the one hand to promote these policies, right, of militarization, that have produced this generalized crisis of human rights in those settings, and then to deny people asylum who are fleeing from the consequences. That's especially perverse, right? Because in both cases, it's US policy that is at the core, right? And so there's a responsibility that we have. I'm a US citizen. I was born and raised in, in uh, the US, a you know, child of Colombian immigrants. Um, I, I think we have to take that very seriously as kind of a, an obligation of citizenship. Right? And of course, in the broader sense of, of global citizenship. In terms of asylum cases, what's the bottom line? Let's remember, immigration courts are administrative courts. They're not Article III courts, for those of us who are you know, in the weeds about that stuff. They're not, um, they don't belong to the judicial branch. Right? They're administrative courts, right? Um, and that means that they're essentially under the sway of executive power, right? They're not truly independent. What does that mean in practice? Let's remember that immigration is defined as a civil matter, not as a criminal matter. So under US constitutional law, right, there's no right to legal representation in immigration court, right? As there would be in a criminal matter. And yet, what many people have said is, let's remember that deportation is kind of a form, and detention, are forms of kind of civic death. Right? So for example, there's an association of immigration court judges that we cite. I uh, heard the president of the Association of Immigration Court Judges, I think her name is Susan Marks, uh, we cite her in the report, said, think about it this way. Immigration court is like traffic court applying the death penalty like traffic court find the death penalty. So what does that say about rule of law, right? So let's go to asylum. How many people who apply for asylum have access to legal counsel and representation in preparing their case? Asylum is a very complex legal matter, right? Just like immigration law is very complex. It's like taxation law or bankruptcy or whatever. Pick your area of specialization. Asylum law, it's very difficult to do a good pro se case, let's say, asylum case. We've had some clients who have and who even been successful, but it's a handful. How many people applying for asylum have access to legal representation or advice, right? And how often are they informed by the Border Patrol that they have the right to seek asylum? It's almost kind of a Miranda kind of issue, right? I mean, we argue that there's a duty on the part of the Border Patrol or whatever ICE or CPP agent that encounters a migrant, that they have the duty to inform that migrant because they could be an asylum seeker, but they have the right to seek asylum. But they don't do so. 80% of the time, they don't do so. So you don't even know you have the right. I mean, what is a Honduran campesino going to know about their right to asylum, right? Unless they have the access to legal advice. And then if they do have lawyers, what do we find? They're denied access to those lawyers when they're detained. So in effect, violations of due process, even when there is legal representation, and when there is legal representation, it's pro bono, of course. Right? Because I mean, where are you going to get the money to pay for these lawyers? Right? And how many are going to be willing to volunteer their services? Now, more and more, this is a local policy issue. I know that there are cities and counties throughout the country inc increasingly, as part of like sanctuary related policies, that are seeking to provide publicly funded legal assistance to migrants under these situations. That's something to fight for in our cities, in our counties, in our states. So that would be very important. Um, but it's kind of pre-Gideon, right? Pre in terms of recognition of the right to legal representation. What are you Let's, seeing yeah. in terms of separation of families? Mm -hmm. um, both from the legal context and the rights context, but also just with the human face. I mean, we're talking about very complex issues. Um, and you talk about being the grassroots perspective and the voice yeah. of victims. And sure. I say also the sure. voice of resilient and strong people, <laughs> not just victims. Right, of course, um, of course. But if you can... I don't know, I, just some insight on what you're seeing in terms of separation of families. I think number one is, um, there was a case that was just filed about this by the ACLU nationally, um, that we you know, joined it. Um, our experience, based on the research we've done, and based on our observations, what we hear is that separation and division of families 
has become a systematic practice, a generalized practice. So that's number one. That's, that's the sound of alarm. Um, and that it's being used as a form of deterrence. Right? So it belongs to that overall paradigm, the iron triangle that I mentioned, of deterrence, detention, deportation. I'd like to ask Gerald, if you don't mind, to share what I, what I tried to mention before, which is your perspective on why this should be understood as an international crime. Um, I'll just answer. I can broadcast this. I'm a clinician for the last 40 years. I've been involved in uh, treatment of uh, refugee survivors of torture. One, one element of torture is rape. Another element is uh, asphyxiation, so waterboarding counts as asphyxiation. The third <coughs> type of torture is forced disappearance. So that a family member is taken and the rest of the family's members don't know where they are, what's become of them, are they alive or dead. They're never able to come to terms with the death because they don't know that there is one. So they're always on tender books. If you look at what happened after the Vietnam War and all the families in this country were worried about um, soldiers who didn't come back and they didn't have a death record. You get some idea on a larger scale. What happens when a family is divided, particularly a child away from its mother or a child away from its father, that's forced disappearance because the child doesn't know whether the mother is alive, what's become of them, whether they love them or are helpless, whether they hate them, and that's for the reason that the child has been taken away. The parent doesn't know who's taking care of it, is the child alive, and so on and so forth. So the suffering that goes on through that is one of the aspects of um, torture that this country is involved with in its um, process of of, of getting rid of immigration and asylum applicants. What you don't know, step earlier than that, which this organization has revealed to me, is that everybody who comes to the border at El Paso, which is a legal crossing point, everybody who comes and applies to immigrate legally, applies for political asylum legally, everybody is imprisoned without exception. And they're made to stay there while their process, theoretically, is going on. And it never goes on. They're, they're there for months until they get up, give up, and return to Mexico, to danger or to death in many cases. And that's an experiment in the El Paso sector. We know it is because it's successful and because the man who developed it has been promoted to the expulsion unit of ICE in Washington. So the long-term border prospect is every legal crossing point will look like a legal crossing point to American citizens and in fact will not be a crossing point. So most of the border will be fence physically and the rest will be administrative fence. Political asylum is dead. Immigration is dead. Mexico will be made into what you see call in this country an Indian reservation. Um, and Gerald Gray works with uh, the Honda Center has a program, <coughs> Human Rights and Trauma Mental Health Program. It's part of the Honda Center, and Professor Beth von Scott is involved. Uh, and you can read about that more on the Honda Center website, and a lot of the work is with um, victims of torture and refugee legal processes, and I really encourage you, and there's opportunities for student engagement as well, so I really encourage you to look at the Honda Center website for that. In closing, before I conclude, um, any calls to action? I mean, we've had a very heavy talk. <laughs> Thank you for your perspective, um, which is very valued. Any calls to action for those of us in the room? Yeah, one is to come join us at the board to come join us at Hope Border Institute and with the other colleagues that we work with on both sides of the border in defense of human rights under attack in this context. And to come for two reasons, to come as interns, to come as researchers, to come as scholars, to come as advocates, to join us in this. From two perspectives, one, 
because of what's going on at the border and what it says about us as a country and us as a civilization, as a community, in the broadest sense. But also because what's happening at the border is becoming the model for national policy in terms of immigration and enforcement. So again, this is the exception becoming the rule. This is what was previously considered to be something marginal and kind of exceptional. You know, the border is kind of an extreme. Our suggestion to you, and I think it's based in empirical research, is that the border, in fact, is the model for what's being applied nationally. And so, in effect, the entire US has become the border. That's, those are the stakes. Please come join us. We need your support. And the Honda Center has a student who is, not to credit for your work, um, has a student who will likely be working with Hope Border this summer. So we invite you to <laughs> please stay afterwards. Um, you're welcome to, I, I don't know your schedule, Camila. I know that yeah, we've got you booked. But we've got a few minutes if you want to invite you to stay after to talk to Jerry, Beth, um, Camilo. And I'd like to invite you all also, if you're interested in uh, refugee and migration issues, this Sunday, the Honda Center, along with a lot of other centers in the Stanford Refugee Research Project, the Marquez, um, and several other sponsors, are film screening Human Flow on mm -hmm. Sunday afternoon. It's the Ai Weiwei, the mm. um, Chinese dissident right. artist, um, did a, uh, a beautiful imagery. There are very little talking, um, but beautiful um, images of refugees and migration globally. Um, and that will be 145 on Sunday, and there's a flyer there. So we invite you to join us for that, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.